The urge to play games from your past often comes in many different forms. For me, it almost always tends to be from remembering or hearing a piece of music, and this happens quite frequently from the 16-bit Sega age. One in particular that comes up time and time again for me is the 1991 Mega Drive, because I'm in the UK, release Alien Storm. I hadn't played this game for years, but after hearing a distinctive camera shutter sound effect on the TV, immediately made me recall the music from the last level, which sent me down a small Alien Storm rabbit hole. I didn't realise until doing my homework quite how many versions of Alien Storm existed, and curiosity got the better of me, so I'm going to be talking about all of them. I'm going to start with the aforementioned Mega Drive version, as this is what I am most accustomed to, having played it countless times before reaching a double digit age, and then I'll move on to the unexpected 7 additional versions. Based on the arcade release a year prior, Alien Storm was one of Mega Drive's early flagship games. Cheap and popular, it almost always made its way into any collection. Back in the early 90s, there was no computer exchange or eBay, so if you wanted secondhand games in the cheap, you had to look to the bargain pages newspaper. I will always remember my brother selling his Mega Drive bundle just to purchase a new one with different games. I think this happened more than once, and if memory serves, Alien Storm always was included in the trade-off, along with the unavoidable Altered Beast. Alien Storm begins by letting you choose from one of three characters in either one or two player modes. Your choices consist of a flamethrower wielding Carla, who without a doubt is a homage to Ripley from Alien. Gordon in a red wrestling costume brandishing an electric gun, and everyone's personal favourite, the robot Scooter, who I always like to think was Crichton from Red Dwarf. The game is a belt scrolling action shooter. You take the role of a one man, or one woman, or one robot, alien slaying machine, as you traverse from left to right making quick work of the invading forces. The first thing that will probably stand out is the creature design. It still holds up as being genuinely creepy. No two aliens are designed alike, and they range from toddler high gremlins to this weird Brussels sprout made of faces in a skirt, to these horrible looking wasp things with big hands. I'll always remember having a nightmare when I was younger about these, that a load of them bumbled their way into my bedroom and just started buzzing around. Combat in the game is your standard belt scroll affair, with a bit of a twist. You have a primary attack controlled by the B button, and a succession of presses whilst connected to an enemy will execute a combo resulting in a knockback. What sets Alien Storm aside from other games in the genre is that your combos change depending on what enemies you are fighting and there are multiple sub-weapons that get utilised depending on their condition. Sometimes this is a rocket, other times a machine gun, a grenade, a smack on the head or gunfire from a leg. It really helps to give the combat more of an ad hoc thoughtful approach like your character is thinking about what the most effective way to exploit a weakness would be. That and everything Scooter does just looks cool. He's a cyborg with an electric whip and can shoot bullets from his arms and feet. He's just badass. Another sidestep from the genre tropes is that there is no immediately definable jump button. Pressing C will instead perform an outlandishly far combat roll out of harm's way, which may seem a tad unnecessary at first, but becomes crucial to strategy later on. There is also a sprint move by double tapping forward, which results in some impressive aerial acrobatics if you press the dodge button. However, once you discover that you can perform a downwards blast at the peak of your ascent, you'll spend the rest of your time trying to land the perfect shot, which only happens once in a blue moon. And we have the big room clearing super move, at the cost of a big chunk of your energy. On the subject of energy, this too depletes as you battle your way through the invaders, though you'll be far pushed to actually run out if you only use your special attack sparsely. If you do run out, then your weapons just won't work, and you'll become rather useless rather quickly, forcing you to resort to pistol whipping and dive attacks until you can find an energy drink. Which brings me on nicely to the first person sections. Scattered throughout the missions, you will enter into different indoor locations, switching the view from the side-scrolling third person to first person rail shooting with free roaming aiming reticule and a good use of layers to give a faux 3D perspective. These sections are massively enjoyable, as not only do we get to see the enemies we have been fighting drawn differently and at a high detail, but all of the environments are appropriately destructible. This is also where we find the bulk of our energy drops and few health pickups there are in the game. It encourages you to make sure you have blasted everything and not miss anything. Health packs, as mentioned, come few and far between, and they don't really do a massive amount to replenish your bar, so health conservation becomes your main key to success, especially in the endgame. And it is three lives and you are out. Choosing to continue after dying will throw you back into the fray with a full life bar, however, if you took a last stand by blowing up Scooter's head over and over, you'll quickly learn that this was a bad idea, as you only get served up a child's portion of extra energy. The game's difficulty also derives, as you might expect, from the quantity and variation of simultaneous enemies thrown at you at one time. Each enemy shares a distinctive size and speed, and the majority of times you'll become unstuck will be avoiding the approach of one enemy to walk into the line of another. This is where the game strongly shares comparison with Golden Axe. 
Both have a very similar engagement pattern of enemies where if you are approached diagonally in close quarters, you are probably going to lose the battle for whose attacks take precedence. This forces you to adopt a method of backing off to arm's length in order to engage safely, or employing the combat roll to reset your distance. Enemies are wise to this however, and will stick to the size of the screen so a misconceived escape can land you in hot water, and being swarmed is a surefire way to quickly end up with very little health. There isn't, as you might expect, a boss battle to every level in the game, and this comes as quite a bit of a disappointment, due to the fact that the ones that we do get are really eerily designed mishmashes of body parts, Instead we get these weird running levels which don't really pose too much of a threat and along with the rail shooter sections, they don't deplete your energy. With all of that considered, the big question that comes out of revisiting any game from the 16-bit era will always be, does what made the game fun back then still apply today? And for the most part, I think that it does. Attacking enemies is always a pleasing experience due to the varied combos and having them throw wobbly whilst catching fire is always rewarding. The soundtrack is something I haven't mentioned until now, but as with most Sega developed games at the time, it's brilliant. It's also not what you might expect given the theme of the game. With the exception of the B-movie style level intros, the music for each level moves away from being targeted horror to be something quite upbeat and playful. The mood does shift when you get to Ulcer, I assume that is what the level is called, judging by the track name, which is far more atmospheric and changes the tone to a more intense, claustrophobic pace. The sound effects are also a little bit odd, but fit the game perfectly. Killing an enemy doesn't give out a shriek or a scream, instead we are graced with something that sounds more industrial, like a bunch of odd wooden planks clattering at the same time. The game is not without fault however, as mentioned previously the enemy patterns can be a bit annoying until you figure out a strategy for moving away from them, and the attacks won't connect if you are too close. There also isn't a massive amount of variety over the 30 minute playtime. There are only a handful of enemy types, and whilst they are all uniquely designed, they do repeat constantly with a few palette swaps towards the end. It would have also been nice to have a few more boss fights in the game. Not counting the last encounter, there is only really one boss fight that we fight twice, the second time forming into this giant rocket firing kebab reel. But the game is most importantly fun, and breaks up the belt scrolling combat in appropriate intervals to throw in the first person and running sections so that it doesn't become tedious. And the last mission introduces further design ideas by having you navigate a giant brain maze with branching paths. For a game that is over pretty quickly, you can't really point out many of its faults for being a deal breaker. For instance, if Alien Storm took 3 hours to get through, I'd probably find the fact that you often only move one step to the right to trigger another set of monsters to be unnecessary padding. It's got a great design, the combat is fun and different to how a lot of games before and since then were displayed, and there's 3 interesting characters to warrant multiple playthroughs. It is also probably one of the easiest Mega Drive games to play today, as it has appeared on every collection released on the last two generations of consoles. You can pick it up from Steam, it's probably on your phone, and the physical copy goes for very little money. So, a recommendation as a game that still holds up well, albeit a little short and sweet. But how does it fare against the blueprint that was the arcade version released the year prior? The answer is, surprisingly well. Quite often the arcade experience at home slogan was nothing more than a marketing ploy to grab some extra cash. But Alien Storm actually resembles its arcade daddy incredibly well. Obviously the arcade version is going to look more appealing, but the contrast between the two isn't a massive leap. The arcade version does have a lot more frames of animation and a deeper colour set, but otherwise the Mega Drive version is very worthy of the title of an at-home arcade game. There is content missing from the Mega Drive release however, and this is sorely missed once you play for the arcade game. We now have a car shop as one of the first person environments. We have a few extra enemy types, not least of which this thing. I mean, out of all the things you could have left out, you would leave that in. Look at it! It's terrifying! Much better than this thing. But most importantly, we get to know that our team of alien busters operate out of a hot dog van, and that Scooter also makes a damn fine waiter. The arcade version is obviously going to trump the Mega Drive release, but there is a lack of difficulty knowing that you can just hit your keyboard to insert another coin. With either version, you're going to be in for a pretty equally enjoyable experience, which can't be said however, for the many other versions that exist. So let's take a look and see how those compare. 
First up, we have the Amiga version. Now, I love the Amiga, as do a vast number of people out there, but unfortunately, the same love just wasn't given to this release. For one, there is no in-game music except for level transitions, the colour palette is less vibrant and a tad depressing, and overall the combat has lost the fluidity it needs to be enjoyable, and overall, it's a bit charmless. We do get the puddle enemies from the arcade version which didn't make it into the Mega Drive release, but overall, it's just a poor experience and probably my least favourite out of all of them. Next up, let's head on over to the Commodore 64. As expected, quite a drop in graphical capability, but to give it credit, it has done a great job at making a fair approximation of what it is trying to imitate. We even get the first person and running sections, which actually don't look half bad. We don't get any sound effects in the game taking favour of music instead, and here I think it works well. We're missing bosses, but overall, a bloody good effort. A definite one for a C64 collector. Let's have a look at what the Amstrad CPC had to offer. This one is certainly lacking in the frames of the C64 version. Combat is quite slow and unresponsive, but it has all the elements of the original model, again including the puddle aliens, which I'm guessing were the easiest enemy to have multiple versions of on the screen at once. We also have the first person sections, which again are a good effort, but a little much more than the CPC can handle. As with the Amiga version, we have sound effects and no music, but here in terms of playability, it isn't terrible, it's just not great either. Ah, the good old Master System. Mentioned previously in my top 18 Master System games, this is a perfect example of a downscaling from 16 to 8 bit. The music is here, the fluidity is here, the first person sections aren't overly ambitious, and it is genuinely fun to play. The main downside of this version is that it's one player only, as multiplayer was something that only improved on the Alien Storm experience. Next we have the Atari ST release, putting of course the arcade and Mega Drive versions at the top. This one certainly comes third in terms of graphics, big sprites, detailed backgrounds, music and sound effects. The only thing missing is the speed. It is a little clunky and missing a lot of frames of animation, but it's perfectly playable. Again, we're missing boss battles, but we still have the first person and running sections, a pretty good effort. And last, but by no means least, we have the outstanding, graphical powerhouse, life-changing ZX Spectrum version. <laughs> Go on, son! It might have seemed like I was taking the piss just then, and I was a little bit, but genuinely I think this is really impressive. It is certainly one of the more playable releases, the game runs fast, it's responsive, and the black and white dot matrix look of it all wouldn't be out of place in a modern indie title. I never owned a ZX Spectrum, so I don't hold any nostalgia for it, but after playing all of these releases, I genuinely think this is my second favourite over the Mega Drive game. The arcade one obviously looks and plays the best, but it is so similar to the Mega Drive version that I could take or leave either one, whereas this just has something amazingly charming about it, regardless of being an Alien Storm game or not. So that's Alien Storm, a game I didn't know until recently had 8 versions, which really does beg the question, why did we never get a sequel? Scooter deserves to be seen in more games, he is lost to the hot dog business. Thank you very much for watching, and I'd be really interested to know if anyone's first or last experience of an Alien Storm game fell outside the arcade or Mega Drive release, if so leave a comment below.